بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ونواله uh, Respected uh, viewers السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome once again to uh, this program purification half of Iman and alhamdulillah up to now we've uh, covered most aspects of relating to this topic in regards to purification, tahara how, uh, what and how and when, certain different rules related to this topic. So Alhamdulillah, through this series we managed to sum up important points that a Muslim needs to know about his Tahara. And inshallah today we'll be taking the, uh, the last uh, session on this topic, purification, half of Iman, uh, which ends, if you like, the chapter of purification. It's been a very summarized uh, and brief sessions, but Alhamdulillah, I think we have managed to cover the most important points therein. Last week we spoke about tayammum uh, and obligations of tayammum, conditions of tayammum, and certain things related to tayammum, which are important for a person to know because sometimes there are certain scenarios, certain situations that a person will be in where he does not have water or he cannot use the water because it's either too cold or maybe due to illness he cannot use the water as well so we spoke a little bit uh, about that uh, as well a point that we need to mention here which is important which is related to placing what's known as uh, al-jaba'ir or al-jabira or this plaster which is put on the on the body to actually help in the uh, healing of bones and, and, and so on so what should one do in this regards I think it's very important for us to understand that when you have something like that due to obviously any accident that you may have or something may have happened a fall or a uh, or a trip or something which has caused you to break your bone is that you still have to look after the aspects related to tahara because it still remains uh, important for a Muslim to know the ahkam, the rules, regulations regarding this uh, topic. So we're just going to look at a, a couple of scenarios which allow us to understand this a little bit uh, further. So we're going to look first of all at if somebody has fallen and injured his leg, his foot, and as a result he has a plaster uh, on the foot which has been left there for uh, a few, is there for a few weeks. Now very important if a person can can do this and that's quite important is that when you put the plaster on so when you before you go to the hospital try and make sure that you have wudu before you put the plaster on because if you think about when we talked about wiping over the foot gear the leather socks the khufain or we said the very the other socks that may match the khufain is that we said that for the wiping to be acceptable a person must have worn those after having full tahara, full purification. So I think this is important for us to do this as well. So that when you actually uh, injure yourself, I know it's difficult sometimes a person might be very uh, stressed and indeed anxious about what's happening, but try and have wudu before the plaster is placed on. Because when you have wudu before the plaster is placed on, it actually allows you to make things much easier for you in the long term because to enable you to wipe over it you need to have uh, put it on tahara so if you have a plaster on the foot let's say it's on the left foot uh, so what you need to do here when you come to when it comes to wudu is that you do your you start off the wudu as normal so you do you know wash your uh, the mouth the nose the face uh, the arms and you wipe the head and then when you come to the feet uh, you basically wash the foot that is not injured because you can do that secondly you wash the parts of the other foot that is not covered might be sometimes the toes or, or whatever then what you do is you take a, a wet hand and you wipe over the rest of the part of the plaster which is covering the foot and then thirdly, you do tayammum for that part of the body which has not been washed. So in this case, you would come and then you do the tayammum where you'd get the earth. You would wipe uh, your face, 
another hitting of the ground and earth and then you would wipe your uh, arms up to and including the elbows and with that you would have made the tahara so that kind of purification is including the ghusl washing includes the masah you are wiping over the the plaster and then you're doing the tayammum to cover the part of the body which has not been washed so that's quite straightforward when it comes to the foot when it comes to the hand or the arm it becomes a little bit more complicated because the washing of the hand or the arm is not going to be complete but also in addition to all of this even the tayammum is not going to be complete because that is deficient as well and that's why there is a bit of a difference amongst the scholars in this regard so first of all let us look at it from if there is it's on the hand okay on the arm here the plaster so what you would do is you would wash your the normal so you start off the wudu as normal wash your uh, face as normal then you would wash the arm that is not injured then you would wash parts of the other arm that is uh, injured but which is not covered by the plaster then you would get a wet hand and you'd wipe over the plaster where uh, it is covering the arm that part of the arm then because if you remember one of the conditions of wudu is tartib is to do it in sequence then what you would do is you would do tayammum for that part of the arm because we have to do this in sequence because that tahara for this arm is still not complete without doing tayammum so you do tayammum now and then once you've done the tayammum you proceed to wiping some of the head and then washing the feet and with that you would have done your wudu and you'll be ready to do your salah or recitation of the quran or uh, tawaf if you are going to do that so that is the things that would make your purification count in this regards with regards to the arm now what i want you to think about now is another aspect to this because there are different opinions of the scholars and the opinion of the ahnaf which is the more easier opinion if you like they said that if you did all this and you had placed the plaster while you had wudu they said that that's fine your wudu is fine and when you do the prayers it's all fine and it's all well in order the shafi scholars they were a little bit more strict about this and they said that when the plaster is on your arm it's actually on a limb which is part of wudu of tayammum so when you come to washing the arm you not you've not washed it when you've come to do tayammum yet yeah, tayammum is also deficient because you couldn't wipe the arm with the earth because it's covered so the wudu is deficient and also the tayammum is deficient so they said that even though you have this a plaster and may have you might have to wear this plaster for a few weeks they said that you would actually have to repeat the salawat when you remove the plaster because of the fact that your wudu was incomplete and your tayammum was incomplete it did not apply for the foot because the foot when you did when you did the tayammum for the foot your arm was not covered so your tayammum was complete and that covered the foot but in this regards it's not complete and i think that is the main issue here so the shafi our shafi scholar said that you would have to actually repeat the salah once you have the uh, ability to do that so once the plaster has come off and you are either able to do the uh, full uh, wudu or you can do at least the limbs of tayammum are not covered with a plaster so i hope that makes it a little bit clear with regards to the ending but, but remember the importance of when if you are uh, if you have injured yourself and you need to go to the hospital to then make sure that you go whilst you have wudu so if they do put a plaster on you you have it while whilst on wudu and with that we complete the section of tayammum we're going to go now on a section which the ulama mentioned towards the end of the book of purification it's important although it's relevant more to our sisters uh, but it is also important that we know this topic as well because it's an important section and that is related to what we call a uh, women's blood women's bleeding uh, and the issue of women's bleeding is related to tahara as well because 
it links to whether or not a woman can do salah, uh, fasting, and so on and so forth. So, if you remember, we said that when a person has uh, not got wudu, then he cannot do three things. He cannot do salah, he cannot do tawaf, because tawaf is salah, is a form of salah, and he cannot uh, touch or carry the mushaf. When a person has a major impurity, then he cannot do five things. Those three things that we've mentioned, in addition to that, remaining in the masjid, uh, and third and four, uh, fifthly, uh, recitation of the Quran. For a woman who has is going through her bleeding, either her menstrual cycle or her postnatal bleeding, then in addition to those five things that she cannot do. She can also not fast, so not allowed to fast as well. And in addition to that, it is not allowed uh, for her to remain uh, or enter the masjid because of the fear that she may uh, actually cause, uh, you know, she may uh, something may cause impurify the masjid. And lastly, she is not allowed to have any. Uh, relations with their husband which includes this intimacy that may happen so that is prohibited as well for her so what is the monthly period they said they defined it as that regular bleeding that a woman has following becoming an adult or adolescent and they really defined it by a number of things a number of terms of its uh, color and so on but we're not going to talk about that but may, what's important for us is the timing so for example for this kind of bleeding they said that the the minimum period for this bleeding is one day and one night so if you like it's a 24 hour uh, thing so if it does uh, if it's less than that then it would not constitute a normal uh, what's known as a menstrual cycle and the maximum is 15 days and 15 nights so these are the, the limits, if you like. Minimum is, is 24 hours, maximum is 15 days and 15 nights. And we'll see the relevance of the maximum in a moment. Usually, on average, it's about six or seven days, as is with most uh, women. So during that period, the woman has to do, uh, abstain from those things that we mentioned. And after she completes that, then she has to do a ghusl, a wash, as we mentioned before. Uh, to uh, get her ready to undertake her normal actions of uh, salah and, and so on. The second type of bleeding is the postnatal bleeding, and that is the type of bleeding that comes after birth, following birth. And again, the ulama, they have placed a minimum and a maximum. Uh, in the Shafi'i Madhab, the minimum is considered a moment. It could be a small moment. Some, some women although very rare, hardly bleed. And they say that's probably one example of this was Fatima عن, who hardly bled or didn't bleed at all after giving birth to Al-Hasan uh, So uh, the least amount is a moment. So some, some women don't bleed. But the, and the maximum amount is 60 days, equivalent to two months. And the average is 40 days, which is about six weeks. So that's the kind of timings for the postnatal bleeding. And again, it's important to know the maximum, which is 60 days, because that will relate to us, which is related to the third uh, type of uh, bleeding. The third type of bleeding is what's known as istihawa, and this is the type of bleeding which is considered abnormal. So it goes more than the normal rates. It goes beyond the maximum and it goes uh, far beyond that. So it becomes, or it becomes erratic. Now, when it goes beyond the maximum, uh, it's difficult for a woman to carry on in that kind of state. And then therefore she would be never praying and never fasting and never be able to do anything else. So the Prophet Sallallahu when he was asked uh, in regards to this matter, he said that, that when the bleeding is more than the maximum, it is like a vessel, if you like, a blood vessel that is just pouring out. So it's not really uh, bleeding related to the womb or such. 
it's a blessing. And he said, ذلك عرق. So it's an عرق, it's like a blessing. So in this regards, the woman has to do certain things. So she, she is not the same as a person who is um, in her menstrual cycle or postnatal bleeding, but rather she is in a state where is abnormal bleeding and so therefore she is still able to do her salah and so on but she has to do the following first of all she has to uh, make sure that she uh, cleans the area and puts appropriate uh, padding to prevent the bleeding uh, continuing secondly she puts on fresh clothes and then she makes the wudu and she does the salah straight away. So she only does this after the entrance of the time of salah, and she does the salah straight away. So there is no delay period. She shouldn't delay it longer than necessary, and she should not do this before the entrance of salah. So something which is called istihawa. So she does the appropriate cleansing, padding, and new cl fresh clothes, and then salah straight away. And whatever blood comes out during that time, it we we say that's. That's fine, she's allowed that concession. And she has to repeat that for every salah. Uh, because obviously uh, it's a question of keeping the cleansiness there. So that is regards to salah. So if it's normal cycle and say it's gone over 15 days, then one 15 days is there. That is the cutoff point. After that, she should go and wash and do all those things. And if it's for postnatal bleeding, the maximum is uh, 60 days and 60 nights. Anything more than that, then she can go into this position uh, as well. Now, this aspect of istihawa, uh, which is also known as continual ritual impurity, you know, continual ritual impurity, because the woman is continuously having, the, you know, the impurity is repeated. It may also happen with certain people uh, in what's known as incontinence and that is when maybe again for a man or for a woman uh, it could be that the person's urine uh, doesn't stop and his bladder can the actual stops that prevent the urine from coming out might be weak and might not be functioning well so a person even though he is uh, gone to the toilet and finished there will could be continuous uh, leaking of urine uh, and this is also known as uh, continual uh, ritual impurity, da'im al-hadath. And this kind of act as well necessitates that a person, it's difficult, you know, if somebody is always doing that, how, he'll say, how can I pray? How can I do my uh, normal, you know, acts of ibadah if that is the situation? So again, similar to the woman who has abnormal bleeding, the person would here do... Uh, first of all, he would wash the area, he would put on some padding, he would change his clothes to fresh clothes, and again, all of that is done after the entry time of salah, and to then go forward and do the salah there and then, so that that is no longer delayed. So it's not done before the entry of salah, but rather it is done after the entry of salah. And with that, the person will be ready to do the salah, but they have to again repeat that at every salah to allow them to actually go through the um, yeah, and to actually allow them to do this uh, the salah or whatever acts they need to do. Maybe it is recitation, uh, you know, the Quran by reading uh, or or so. With today, actually, we've managed to complete the sections about purification which is an important part of fiqh because it's important to know uh, your Islam from this perspective. You know, that's why the Prophet ﷺ is saying, yani, it's purification is half of Iman. This is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ because it's so important. It's important to understand the reality related to this topic so that when you practice your Islam, you're practicing it based on uh, knowledge. And... Uh, so do phone in if you have any questions. Uh, the, the sessions have covered basically aspects related to water. We've spoken about water. We've spoken about what wudu is, what makes up wudu, the obligatory aspects of wudu, the 
six elements that make up wudu. We've spoken about what is recommended in wudu. We've spoken about what breaks your wudu. We've spoken about uh, certain issues and conditions related to wudu. Then we spoke about ghusl because ghusl is also the major uh, ritual purification. Uh, we mentioned, first of all, what necessitates ghusl. And we mentioned those six uh, things related to uh, ghusl, which are three are specific for women uh, and three for men and women. And then we spoke about things related to wiping over the leather footgear. We've spoken about going to the toilet and the etiquette of going to the toilet, relieving yourselves, what you should do and what you should not do. In addition to all that, we went on to speak about uh, a topic which is also very important, which is actually knowing what the impurities are. So what makes up the impurities? And we listed the impurities. We mentioned the different, uh, you know, the different impurities that are there, the different liquids that make up impurities. Uh, we mentioned about the animals and so on, because all of that is important for us to know, because if any of those impurities come on our body or on our clothes, we have a duty of washing those impurities off so that our salah in those clothes or in our bodies will be uh, acceptable. So we mentioned that as well. And then we mentioned a little bit about uh, aspects related to how you can change things from impure to pure and lastly or oh, sorry before last we spoke about tayammum which is the dry ablution and then we went on to talk about the women's bleeding so all these topics which make up the purification it's very important that a person knows them to make sure that his wudu is correct uh, and also we have to be aware that sometimes there are certain things in our practice of wudu uh, that if we don't do properly, they can actually harm us uh, a lot. So please, you know, please give us a call. Uh, our telephone number is 0203-397-2095. The number's on the screen. So give us a call if you've got any questions or any comments that you'd like to uh, make on this program. What things that are usually made, common mistakes in people who uh, do the purification first of all the first most common mistake is that people don't know the purification rules and if you don't know the purification rules you are falling into mistakes because you don't know what is you must do and what you mustn't do secondly when it comes to washing a lot of the time people rush their wudu and so they miss vital parts of wudu which make up wudu so when you come to wash the face, it's important to wash all the face, all the barriers and the boundaries within the face. It's not just about washing, you know, sometimes people do it very quickly without, with missing the barriers, you know, the, so the face starting from here and up to the ears and all the way down to the, the chin. So it's a matter of, of making sure that's washed properly. When it comes to the arms, how many times do people make wudu and they don't wash their elbows? So they leave the elbows dry or indeed with their feet, they leave the ankles uh, dry uh, or the heels. And the Prophet Sallallahu when he saw a group of the Sahab, they hadn't washed their heels properly. He said, وَيْلٌ لِلْأَعْقَابِ مِنَ النَّارِ uh, Woe to the heels from the fire, indicating that if a person doesn't wash properly, uh, he is at risk uh, of being punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of fire. So that's another common mistake uh, that happens by people by not paying proper attention to the areas that are washed. Another common mistake which is related to purification is that not knowing the impurities and as a result not cleansing the body or parts of the body properly from impurities and what happens therefore is a person might not cleanse his uh, you know his clothes properly uh, or he may not do proper istinja trying to seek the tahara and as a result his clothes may have najasa when he comes to pray his prayer is not sound so how many times the prayer has been messed up because somebody has not done proper purification and tahara. So that's very important for us to revise this and make sure that we do that in the correct way.
also we mentioned I, I don't know if you remember but we mentioned a few sessions back we talked about the danger of uh, the aspect related to going to the toilet and not covering yourself properly not veiling yourself from the urine and we said in one hadith the Prophet ﷺ said min al -bawl fa inna al -qabri minhu. He said clean yourself you know not just clean yourself but protect yourself from the urine because the majority of the punishment of the grave was in the urine related to the urine a very important point that we have to always guard uh, in this uh, regards uh, as well and uh, lastly and what is important as well is that we have to make sure that we understand what is allowed in terms of our concessions you know the, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us rukhas which is considered permissible things to allow us certain you know th some because the deen is easy ma ja'alallahu alaykum fi deen min haraj there's no difficulties in the deen it's, it's made easy so sometimes you have the ability to wash the instead of washing the feet you have the uh, uh, you know the if you like the concession the ruhsa to wipe over the leather foot gear or for example when you don't have water or your water is not enough for you then again you have the permission to the tayammum and so on so all these things are allowing you concessions and ruhas for you to take use of because when you do that uh, you are making life easier for you because Allah doesn't want to make things hard for you now sometimes some people might find a bit difficult for them to take these concessions like for example if they felt no I don't really uh, need to do um, you know I don't believe in wiping over the, the, the leather socks or the you know the thick uh, socks uh, because I don't I don't feel that that's best we say yes it's better to wash the feet it's better to wash the feet but it becomes recommended to wipe over the socks and the leather socks specifically when a person finds that he is not comfortable doing it because the the the, the finding that discomfort doing it means that you have a bit of a problem with the concession that Allah is giving you so I think that's also important for us uh, to note inshallah ta'ala so um, if you have any questions uh, we still got a few more minutes left inshallah before the end of the show telephone number is on the screen it's 0203 397 so uh, you're more welcome to phone Obviously, now that this section of purification is complete, it's important for uh, the person to then go on to a next chapter, which is related to understanding Salah and the rules related to Salah. And because again, Salah is that backbone uh, which everything is based on, the backbone of the Deen. And therefore, it is important for a person to understand uh, the rules of Salah, which is the follow-up to purification that's why purification is half of iman iman, because it's that access if you like it's that key which takes you forward into the salah inshallah yes and we have we have Hello? we have a caller assalamu alaikum yes uh, welcome to star tv what, what is your question alaikum salam uh, I want to question uh, if you have uh, 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 Udu, 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 uh, uh, I have Udu in the morning. Yes. Uh, after that, uh, the, the break, uh, if you wear the socks, I, I make Udu and uh, I make Udu or and, uh, and I, I take off the uh, in uh, 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 socks. You took off the socks. Yeah. No, before I have udu. Okay, so you made wudu, yes. Yeah. After that, uh, the udu is broken. Right. 
after that uh, the words i uh, the sources i take off uh, after that i udu i make udu a yes. new udu yes okay so what, what is the question and um, for uh, salat uh, for dhuhr yeah I ha and i have udu if you are, I go outside, if you, the Udu is broken, uh, I, I take uh, off uh, the socks. socks uh, oh, 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 okay. oh, oh. Right. I don't understand for it. Yes. Uh, okay, thank you, inshallah. I'll answer that question. So, so basically what the sister is saying is that in the morning she started off with Wudu and then she put on her socks. Then the Wudu was broken uh, while she's outside the house. What does she do? Uh, and if the wudu was broken and then she took off her socks, what should you do? So if you've made wudu and then you've put on the socks, and remember we said they have to be thick socks uh, to in line with the, the leather uh, foot gear. So you've put on the thick socks and then you've gone out the house and then your wudu is broken and then you need to do salah. So here you do the the washing of the face, arms, wipe of the head, and then you can wipe over the socks. And we said you just need to wipe a little bit of the top part of the socks. That will uh, be sufficient for your wudu. But if you made wudu, then you put on the socks, and then your wudu was broken, and then you took off the socks, before doing the wudu again, then here in this case you have to wash the feet fully. You can't once you take off the socks, you can't put the socks back on and continue the masah. So I think that is an important point to understand. So as long as you have you've made the wudu, you've put on the socks and you've kept the socks on, you've not taken them off, then you can wipe over the socks for one whole day and one night, 24 hours from the point period of breaking your wudu. Okay, we have another question. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Look, I would like to ask you one question. Yes. Go ahead. And I walk in place in day sometimes, and you know the when I change the baby's nabi, I use the gloves. Yes. And I do the wudu before I leave my home. Yes. Is it broken my wudu? You are wearing if I gloves. I the private area. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Well, if you are wearing exactly like for that question, if you are wearing gloves and you are covering your hands, then that does not break your wudu, because there is no touching skin to skin that doesn't break the wudu. But if you are not wearing gloves and you touch the private parts. Uh, of another individual, even if it's a child or indeed yourself, then that would break the wudu. So the gloves form a barrier and the barrier will therefore mean that the wudu is not broken. And you do not have to repeat the wudu. Jazakallah. We got more, one more question. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, there's the, we seem to have lost that uh, call. So, inshallah, uh, thank you for, for calling in with those questions. And really, and just to end, because we only have half a minute left, is that very important for us, in this topic specifically, and other topics, that we do not be, we're not shy about asking questions. Because sometimes, you know, certain issues, I know this issue of purification sometimes related to private things, private matters, very important that you do not carry on practicing your deen with not knowing. But it's better to go and ask. Ask the question, and if you don't know, say, I don't know, I need to ask the question. Because when you ask the question, you will learn. And if you don't ask the question, you say, oh, I'm shy, or maybe you feel so, you are old, you've been doing something, you don't want to, no. Go and ask, because the Prophet ﷺ said, when, uh, and it was quite, quite, quite a bad thing that happened actually, because one of the Sahaba, he had a big cut, he had like a cut in his head, injury in his head, and he needed, uh, he had a wet dream, he needed to do ghusl, and they were in a journey, but the water uh, was cold, and they were in a journey, so he said to his friends who were with him, he said, I have I need to do ghusl, but I have this big cut. 
do you think it's okay for me to do tayammum? Tayammum, remember we talked about, he said, they said to him, no, you have to do ghusl. So he did ghusl, and as a result, the water got into the injury, and he died because of that. Subhanallah. So when they went back to the Prophet Sallallahu do you know what the Prophet said? He said, Qataluhu qatalahum Allah. They have killed him. May Allah kill them. They have killed him. Because they didn't kill him directly, but because of their fatwa, without knowledge, they resulted in his death. Because he should have done tayammum. He has an injury, he can't do ghusl, he should do tayammum. But because they gave the fatwa without knowledge, the Prophet ﷺ said they led to his death. So do you see how dangerous it is? So, and he said, Allah sa'alu, should they have not asked if they didn't know? Because the, the cure of ignorance is questioned. So my dear respected brothers and sisters, as we come to the end of this uh, program, which is uh, purification, half of Iman, uh, it's very important to emphasize this point and inshallah uh, we hope that you have made use of these sessions please go and visit our YouTube channel to watch the other sessions if you have missed them I think they're very important for adults and children to learn about their purification Jazakumullah khair thank you for being with us and until we meet you again Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh